Well, that introduction's a little bit harder than the one he got to give me last week. <laughs> but um, I did want to say, I don't know if you've noticed something about my husband is that he doesn't like to let on how good he is at some things. And I see your smiles. You know what I'm talking about. One of the things he was extremely patient about was that for seven years, I worked for this ministry. Um, and sometimes that meant that I was traveling to places like Colombia, South America, and Costa Rica, and Rome, and Kansas in the middle of nowhere, and um, at, at various times, and sometimes really inconvenient times. And he didn't complain, and he was always really supportive. And uh, sometimes I just like being able to give him a shout out and point out how supportive he was of the work that I did because Without the without the family kind of being on board with it, you can't you can't effectively do ministry, and that was what I was able to do for for seven years. Uh, I worked for and then there were none that organization that Chris mentioned that was started specifically to help abortion clinic workers leave their jobs in the abortion industry and find new work, but more importantly find healing and in a lot of ways um, find their faith again. And throughout those seven years. I was able to personally become a client manager, meaning uh, I would take on a woman as she was leaving her job in the industry, sometimes even before she had actually quit, and walk with her through the process of quitting, of job searching, and of healing. Um, I had, I think by the time uh, I left, and then there were none, I had 30 active clients, and I had had 80 uh, who I had in some way been part of part of their healing in person, uh, which is pretty amazing. All told, by the time I had left and then there were none, which was about a year ago, uh, I, uh, I think the total so far was 500 people who had quit their jobs in that industry and, and come through the ministry. So that's pretty amazing. But through working with these women, um, my background being in trauma, uh, and trauma triage, and my work as a doula who specifically would help with grief and bereavement sort of helped me assist these women in, in their journey through, through healing and quitting. And as the ministry itself grew, and as we listened to the stories of, of these workers, we kind of started to get this big picture. And it was the big picture of the abortion industry. Now, how many of you have been to uh, March for Life? Uh, how many of you have done a life chain? Been to a pro-life talk at openness, at work camp, at some diocesan event, at a church? Pretty much, I think everyone has raised a hand at this point. So you've kind of grown up hearing the pro-life message, and you've probably heard the theology of what it means to be pro-life, and you've probably heard the philosophy of what it means to be pro-life. I'm not going to regurgitate that to you today. I might reference it. But you see, what I really want to talk about is the idea of this industry that abortion has built. And what we could say is the fruit of that industry. A lot of you have heard the word intersectionality. It's a big buzzword. We like to talk about it with more progressive topics. But there is an intersectionality with abortion that nobody wants to talk about. And as we worked with these clinic workers, it became clearer and clearer. Here's what I mean. One of my clients actually never worked in the clinic. She never worked in abortion clinic. She was a researcher at a university. And her job was to work in pharmaceuticals, finding cures for diseases. However, she quit her job working in a prestigious university because she was specifically asked to build a database that would help other universities exchange and request the body parts of babies. And these body parts of these little babies were obtained through abortions at the hospital that worked with the university. So she became one of our clients. She actually ended up revealing a whole dark side of the abortion industry, which is funded by 
tax dollars. The National Institute of Health provided grants specifically to fund the trading, the procuring is what they call it, and the compensation for babies, more specifically for parts of babies. That's the industry. See, it starts when a woman walks into a clinic. And a lot of times when a woman walks into a clinic, she doesn't want to be there. The lie that abortion is liberating is just that, a lie. Nine times out of 10, and this is what statistics and women who've been asked this very question have told us, when she's walking into that clinic, she either feels so desperate that she has no choice or she's being coerced. That's where it starts. Where does it end? It, it doesn't. Abortion is so insidious. It's permeated our medicine, our universities, and without even realizing it, we in some way, or if you're a taxpayer, you in some way, have helped fund it. You know, that, that's the thing about evil, right? It, it creeps in. There's this really great quote I found on the internet, so it must be true. Um, I don't even know who said it because I found it on Pinterest. <laughs> but I thought it was good. It said, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. That really sums up the experience of not only the clinic workers, but every single person who plays a part in abortion as an industry. It is institutionalized evil. And they are everyone, everyone within this institution is a victim, including the doctors, including the workers. Now that, that can be hard to wrap our heads around sometimes because we like to have an enemy. Right? We want to fight somebody. We want somebody to be wrong so we can be right. And in a lot of ways, as a movement, the pro-life movement has kind of demonized those who work in the clinics because we want that enemy. They're not our enemy. They're human beings. And if we're truly pro-life, and we believe that every single person has value, and every single person is created in God's image and has dignity worth defending, then so do the abortion clinic workers. Once the movement started realizing that, clinic workers became safer leaving their jobs. And when they did, the fact that they too were victims became more and more clear. Victims of what? Evil. Sin. You know, one of the things we, we did with our, our workers was we had um, we would have healing retreats. And we would invite them to come on these retreats. And there would kind of be a deep dive into really beginning the hard work of healing. And if you've ever had to heal from something, you know it's hard work sometimes, especially the inside stuff. Well. At these retreats, our workers would, would share some of their stories with us. And one of the things we asked them to do was to come up with their number. Their number. The number of abortions that they were directly, that they directly had a, a part in. The number of babies whose lives they helped end. And one of our workers, I'll never forget, as she was doing the math, she realized that her number was more than 30,000. And she looked at us and said, that number could fill an NFL football stadium. She had to think about that. And she had to figure out how in the world she was going to heal from the image of 30,000 little faces looking at her from the inside of a football stadium because that's what she pictured. The clinic workers, so many ways, are just as much a victim as the woman walking into the clinic who's been coerced. And of course, no one is a greater victim than the baby whose life is lost. But if we get back to the idea of this institutionalized evil, 
I'm going to bring out my friend again. Remember Mo the Mad Cow? Remember how we said that any time we violate the natural order, any time we violate the natural law, that there are consequences and they're never good. Well, this is true even if we look at an institution. There are consequences and they're never good. That's one of the things that was revealed as we began to talk with our clients, with our workers. And so I, I'd like to give you just some basic national statistics to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. As an industry, as an institution, there is a website that has taken a look at clinics across the United States and is trying to compile statistics about every clinic so that we can share this, this information. Well, of all the clinics so far that information has been gathered on, it was found that 50% of them 50%, that's half, failed to properly sterilize the instruments that they were using from woman to woman to perform the abortions. Okay, think about that for a minute. How many of you have been to a doctor's office? No one's been to the doctor. <laughs> you all are the healthiest people I've ever met, right? Or the dentist, right? Anytime you go into a, a medical facility, the doctor washes their hands first thing they do. The nurse washes her hands, it's the first thing they do. Then they grab these handy dandy little gloves and they put them on before they even approach you. And then when they leave, they take off the gloves, they wash their hands again. It's like the ritual. <laughs> In between patients, that room is, is sterilized, right? <laughs> Somebody's in crisis. <laughs> That's all right. Laughing is good. This is a heavy topic. Sorry. No, no, you're, you're good. Like I said, laughing is good. Break it up a little bit. So when you've been to the dentist or the doctor and they have to actually use some sort of instrument to help with your checkup or your surgical procedure or you know looking in your mouth because you're going to get a cavity prepared you ever notice how they they like peel back this like plastic and they take out the little instruments from the plastic it's because those instruments have been sterilized they've been through this whole process and put in a machine to make sure that they're sanitary and clean that seems like a no-brainer. We don't even think about it, right, when we go to the doctor. When we get to the doctor's office, we notice that, you know, the, the, the bed or the chairs we have to sit in, they've been cleaned, they've been sanitized. Why? Well, because it would be super disgusting if they weren't. So when we're talking about this, these half of the abortion facilities that we know of failed to properly sterilize their instruments that means they are performing surgery on women with equipment that has not been cleaned. Or if it has been, it's been cleaned improperly. Now, how do we know this? Well, because I'll get to questions at the end. Um, every, not every, I'll get to that one too. So we know these statistics because in every state but nine of them, Medical facilities are required to be inspected to make sure that they're, you know, keeping up with their licenses, to make sure that what they're telling you about being safe and legal and all that stuff is actually true. So there are public health inspectors that will come to abortion clinics. And while they are there, they will observe what's going on and they will inspect. Well, these inspection reports are public. So through Freedom of Information Act requests, the Check My Clinic database requested all of these inspection reports. Let's think about that for a minute. Um, 
Have you ever had that experience where your mom or dad tells you, you know, uh, you need to be doing your homework right now and I better see you doing your homework? And when they would leave the room, you'd kind of be like, whatever, not going to do my homework. And then they come back in the room and you're like, I am so studious. Look at how well I am doing my homework, right? Or, you know, clean your room. I better see you making this room look super clean. And then they leave, and maybe we take our time, or maybe we get distracted. And then mom or dad show back up, and we're like, oh my gosh, I'm the best cleaner in the world. Have you seen how I'm shining this? We've all done that, right? I'm not the only one. My kids aren't the only ones. <laughs> so imagine this health inspector, okay, showing up to an abortion facility, and they do it unannounced in most cases. Don't you think that the people who work there would be like, oh no, Best behavior, everybody. The health inspector's here. I can actually tell you for a fact that that's exactly what they say. I can also tell you for a fact that they actually try to hide the things they know will fail them in the inspection report. So, the statistics I'm sharing with you are what the health inspectors saw when everybody was already on their best behavior. Imagine what happens when they're not. Like you keep that in your mind. So on their best behavior, 50% of these clinics didn't have clean instruments. 75% failed to implement what we call in inspection control standards, meaning everything had to be according to the book, the rules, that prove that they're keeping their clinic clean. 75% on their best behavior. 47% had narcotic violations, meaning either they had controlled substances, narcotics, that were accessible to anyone, weren't locked up, were expired, or were administered improperly. That's really great when we have a nation that already has a narcotic drug problem. 70% failed to have a quality assurance plan. It means the checks and balances that they have for each other to make sure they're keeping things clean and sanitary and safe. 70% on their best behavior. One clinic, this is my favorite, the inspector found a case of beer at the bottom of the steps of the clinic so the staff could, I don't know, drink it? Because who doesn't want a doctor or a nurse drinking beer when they're doing major surgery and administering anesthesia to you? Best behavior. That's scary stuff. This is what's going on in a clinics across the country while you're being fed that lie that abortion is safe, that it's liberating, that it's somehow necessary. You see, that's what happens, right? That's what happens with sin. That's why I like that quote that I found on Pinterest. It takes you farther than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. and costs you more than you ever want to pay. But let's bring it a little closer to home. Let's talk about clinics in Virginia. <coughs> this page right here are inspection violations from just one. One. And it goes on to the second page. This gem of a facility is in Charlottesville not too far from here. A couple of the highlights. Unlicensed staff drawing medication. In other words, you are not qualified to be doing what you're doing. And you know what? That was something we saw all the time. I really can't tell you how many of my clients I would talk to. And I would say, okay, well, what were you doing in the clinic? And some of them would be like, oh, well, you know, I was working the sonogram machine, or I was getting out medication, or I was helping with anesthesia, or I was writing prescriptions because the doctor had signed the prescription pad, so all I had to do was hand it out to women. Oh, okay, um, are you a, a, a certified sonogram technician? No. Okay, are you a pharmacist? No. Are you a physician's assistant? No. Are you a nurse? No. Um, okay, but what, you know, what's your education? Uh, I graduated high school. Great, where did you work before this? McDonald's. 
Well, how did you get your training? Oh, they taught me how to do it when I got there. I cannot even begin to tell you how common that story is. Planned Parenthood actually has their own in-house training. It means nothing. It doesn't qualify you for anything. In fact, some of these women who would come to us really thought they were qualified to do, you know, medical stuff. And when they wanted to apply for more jobs, we had to tell them, well, no, actually, you're not. You're not licensed. You're not certified. You're not even trained properly. The bulk of the clinics have violations in, in basic first aid. They didn't even know how to do CPR. They didn't know how to control bleeding. But it's safe. So back to Charlottesville. Expired medications, they were still giving out to women. Expired supplies, still using them. Uh, no employee on the premise was certified in advanced cardiac life support, not even the doctor. Uh, they didn't keep records, so they had no record of any of the vital statistics on any of their patients. You know, like important things like, do you react to anesthesia? Do you have blood pressure problems? What are you allergic to? No records. There was no health screening of the employees. The staff didn't maintain the equipment that they were supposed to use to sterilize the instruments used in the abortions. Um, you know, the ones that are used from woman to woman. Basically, dirty instrument to dirty instrument to woman to woman to woman. That's disgusting. No discharge orders were ever signed by doctors. No documentation. No notes to make sure that the patients were safe to be discharged. The recliners where the women were placed to recover after their procedures were not disinfected in between people. The facility didn't have the equipment to monitor the hearts of women who were under sedation. And they used expired medication. And that's not even all of it. If we want to go head out towards Nova, out in Manassas, the Amethyst Center, Amethyst Health Center for Women. Non-licensed staff members giving injections, assisting with abortions, literally assisting in the procedure. Not a doctor, not a nurse, not a tech, not licensed at all. No verification of any of the credentials for the employees that were supposed to be licensed. That sounds great. Are you qualified to work here? Sure. Don't need to require any proof. The women who went there would have no idea if the people performing the procedures, giving them medications, putting them under anesthesia, were even qualified to do so. There was no contract from the physician performing the abortion, because that's safe. You know, actually there was a clinic here in Virginia that one of the doctors <laughs> technically wasn't a doctor. When, um, when the inspector got there, the inspector said, you know, okay, you have to prove to be your doctor, that's what they do. And the doctor handed him his resume. And the inspector, being a good inspector, is like, well, resume doesn't count. I, I need to see, like, you know, your actual credentials. He didn't have any. He didn't want to take the final tests necessary because he thought he was too smart for them. That's what he told the inspector. Crazy, right? Again, that's on their good behavior. So here we are in Nova. There was no informed consent obtained for a minor having an abortion. Child, a child shows up. They don't ask the parents what's wrong. Why is your child here? There was no screening to see if that child had been abused in any way and that's what contributed to the fact that that child was pregnant. Simply perform the procedure. Chairs in the recovery room weren't cleaned, they had rips. Gross. This one's super fun too. The staff did not wash their hands after removing their gloves between going woman to woman. The recliners were not disinfected between patients. And the staff admitted to being unaware of the procedure to maintain a safe and sanitary environment because they had never been trained on like how to clean up. That's gross. 
That's just two. Virginia has a bunch more, and they all have the same kind of problems that have been discovered when they're supposed to be on their best behavior. It's gross. If we go north a little bit, probably the closest abortion facility to us is Hagerstown, Maryland. Hagerstown has a persistent rat infestation that for some reason they just won't get rid of. So you could be heading in there for an abortion procedure and you will see rats running around. Anybody know anything about rats? They're kind of dirty and, you know, not sanitary. But no, Hagerstown's got their rat problem. Hagerstown also, keep in mind again, this is in front of the inspector. As everyone's on their best behavior, the inspector witnessed one of the nurses go and clean the toilet that had just been used by a woman who had just had a procedure with her bare hands and then went and without sanitizing her hands or putting gloves on, tried to wipe down the chair that she placed another woman in to recover. This is in front of the health inspector. What in the world are they doing not in front of the health inspector? Guys, that's so nasty. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Like, who does that? Yep. Hold on to it. I'll get to it at the end. I promise I will leave time for questions. This is another place in Hagerstown where the physician didn't conduct a history on any women. No idea if it's even safe to use medications or anesthesia for her. Maryland has just as many problems as Virginia. Germantown, Maryland has another stellar place where the Facility failed to document that all staff were competent to do their jobs. My dog gets better care at the veterinary clinic than women do going into facilities like this. And again, there are more. I won't, I won't bore you, I think we've got the point, right? This one's super great here out in Maryland. Potomac Family Planning Center in Rockville. 103 of those peel packs, 103, were stained and discolored and found to not have been sanitized properly. That was after they'd already used however many because the staff admitted they didn't know how to use the sanitizing machine. Awesome. Physicians weren't checking medical records, no documentation of orders or anything that they did to women. So think about that too, right? If, if a doctor isn't documenting what they've done for you and you have, let's say, a complication, like has happened in many cases, um, and you end up in the emergency room, they're gonna wanna see what was done so they know either what not to do or they know kind of what they're looking at or for to try to help you get better. Well, if there's no documentation, how are doctors supposed to know? In fact, right over the border here in West Virginia, that happened. The patient actually, as the procedure started, demanded, <laughs> there we go. demanded that the procedure be stopped. Okay, so here we have a patient who is revoking their consent, basically, okay, verbally to the doctor in the witness of other people who are helping with the procedure, and the employees physically restrained the patient in order for the doctor to complete the procedure. And then, when the patient suffered severe abdominal pain, heavy bleeding for 24 hours, they went to the emergency room where they didn't have any documentation on what happened to them. And it was determined that the procedure itself was incomplete. I'm not gonna go into detail about what that means because I'm going to spare you. No one from that abortion clinic ever followed up with the patient to make sure they were okay. The only thing that followed up was a complaint that the patient herself lodged against the doctor. This is institutionalized evil. This is what happens when we take something that is so bad, something that is sinful, and we try to convince not only ourselves, but a country, but a culture that it's good. This is the fruit of institutionalized evil. This is the fruit of abortion. You know, 
St. Augustine has a really great saying. He said, the truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Let it loose and it will defend itself. This is the truth. This is facts. The truth about abortion. And I could literally stand here all day telling you stories from all across the country. As it is, these were just our local clinics. You know, as if it wasn't bad enough. Did you know there are actually some states in which abortion um, isn't regulated at all? That the clinics aren't even considered to be medical clinics. So they aren't inspected. They aren't governed by any sort of regulations. Idaho, Minnesota, New Hampshire, Maine, Alabama, all unlicensed, all unregulated. Who the heck knows what goes on in there? We can't, can't even freedom of information request something that isn't inspected. Not only that, but those states are all part of the nine under which it is legal to obtain an abortion throughout all nine months of pregnancy. All nine months, nine states. In all the other states, and some of them you have to take case by case, but 97% of abortions are what we call elective. You see, for a while the lie was it's safe, it's legal, and it's rare. No. And we're thrown, we have thrown at us, right? Well, what about in, in the case of medical necessity? You'll hear that argument when 97% of the abortions that are performed in this country are not for that medical necessity that everyone says is so important. That says something. And furthermore, there's a, there was a movement in Ireland to legalize abortion that was eventually successful. And during this, this battle that they had, um, that came up over and over again. You know, well, what about the medical necessity? What about when it's in, intended to save the life of the mother? Or what if abortion has to happen because the, the child's going to die anyway? And all of these scenarios were thrown at the pro-life people in Ireland. And so there were doctors, hundreds of doctors, who signed something called the Dublin Accord. And the statement that they signed in Dublin basically said that as doctors, OBGYN family practice doctors, who are competent and at the top of their fields, all said, no, there is actually never a case in which it would be necessary to end the life of a baby directly in order to save the life of a mother. That in those instances, it is always you try to save them both. And at the very least, you do what you can. And if the unintended consequence is that the baby doesn't make it through your efforts to save both, that's not a direct abortion. That's a very sad situation that happened because sometimes medicine can't save everyone. This is heavy stuff, isn't it? Why do I share it with you? Well, because like St. Augustine said, right, the truth is a lion. Let it out. That's your job. That's who you are now. You've, you've, you've learned the theology of it. You've heard the philosophy of it. You've gone to the March for Life. You've gone to the pro-life talks. You've heard the, the so-called, right, the, the pro-life heroes and, and the famous pro-lifers that we tend to idolize sometimes and think they're the ones who are going to end abortion. No. Talking, talking doesn't end abortion. I'm going to go so far, and this is speaking as someone who spent seven years in the pro-life movement. Activism itself doesn't end abortion. The very most important thing any one of you will do that will contribute to the ending of abortion is done on your knees in that church. And you see, that's the other lie. Satan is so sneaky. And this is his domain. He owns abortion. And so he would love to get us 
so fired up about it that we get so busy doing things. So busy being activists and pro-life warriors that we forget the most fundamental part of fighting abortion. And that is on our knees praying for it today. You know, Jesus said that when we trust him, there is absolutely no limit to the miracles that he can work, to the mercy that he can extend. Except we tend to not trust him enough to say, Jesus, I know you're the only one who's actually going to end this. End it. If you need to use me, great. But the minute we stop saying that prayer and instead we get so busy trying to end it, Satan's gained a little bit of an upper hand. So if there's anything you take away from this, it's learn the truth. Learn the facts about abortion, about the institutionalized evil and its ugly fruits. So you can share that truth. Because like St. Augustine said, that truth is going to defend itself. But then, then get on your knees. Then pray. Then trust. That's how we end it. That's how we stop it. And that is the only way we fight evil. You fight evil with love, you fight evil with prayer. That's what will end abortion. All right, I promised questions. I will take questions now. You were first. Okay, so the question I was going to ask, I'm curious. Um, with the sterilization instruments, is it that they weren't sterilizing them, which is bad enough, or were they not sterilizing or disinfecting them, which is? Um, in some cases, it's both. So in a lot of times, you have to autoclave, it's called autoclave, okay. which is sterilizing and disinfecting at the same time. Um, and so in some of the reports, you'll see that the autoclave machine itself was broken, but they were throwing stuff in there anyway, which does absolutely nothing. That's like putting dirty utensils in a dishwasher that's broken, and then turning on the dishwasher and being like, oh yeah, they're going to be clean when they come out. What? Right? Um, in other cases, it's they simply weren't doing it. In other cases, it was, oh, we don't know what we're doing. Maybe this is how we sterilize things. But if you don't follow the actual procedure to sterilize it properly, it's not going to get clean. So, yeah, it's a little bit of all of it. The other question was um, malpractice. I'm guessing they're not liable for malpractice. Is that true? Well, it's hard to be liable for malpractice when you aren't licensed to the first place. <laughs> If you what? Wouldn't that incur federal penalties? You know, it, abortion is sort of the exception. Because you would think that with inspection reports like this, yeah. the consequence would be shut this place down, or fix it, lines. right? And that doesn't happen. So These places. It's an oversight. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. What are the nine states in which the nine states for all nine months are Alabama, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Oregon, Vermont, Washington, D.C., Colorado, and um, the one caveat is that in some of these states, the clinic itself may set a arbitrary number and say, well, we're only doing them up through 27 weeks, or we'll only go up to 25. But uh, the state itself doesn't have a limit. And in Colorado and New Mexico, New Mexico in particular, it's all the way through term with no limits. So basically off of what you were saying, all you would have to do is be a citizen to work at an abortion clinic? You might not even have to be a citizen. That's <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Do you have a question? Oh, he, he basically asked the same oh, okay. question. Any other questions? If you want to find out this information for yourself, check my clinic.org has the inspection reports. Um, the Charlotte Lazier Institute has some really great statistics as well. Um, and Children of God for Life is another really good resource. So. Thanks, guys. <laughs>